opportunities and challenges. Sarah, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank uh, you. My name is, is Mark Offenbeck. I'm an open dialogue uh, trainer, um, assistant professor at Norwegian University of Science and Technology and part of the Odessi trial. Uh, myself and Georgie Park will be chairing this session. Georgie, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Georgie and I'm a research assistant also working on the Odessi trial, which is a large trial taking place in England. Thank you, Georgie. You'll be moderating the chat session, so hope everyone is active. Introduce yourselves, ask any questions, use either the chat or the question and answers. We'll try and keep track of both of those. Unfortunately, uh, Corin Handy couldn't join us. Corin has been one of the staunchest supporters of, of Open Dialogue for a year. Uh, involved Nottingham uh, almost 10 years ago, started, started the uh, Open Dialogue Nottingham um, group uh, eight years ago, I think it is now, and has done uh, very much to, to support the implementation of, of uh, Open Dialogue in England. So, Corin, sorry that you can't make us, but you're with us in spirit. Sarah, very glad that you could join us. Um, we'll give the word to you if you would like to introduce yourself. Um, okay, yeah, my name's Sarah Corin. I, I work also in the in the Odessi trial team um, with Corin and, and others. Um, so, our, my background is actually um, a service user survivor researcher. And we are working on um, particularly with peer practitioners uh, to understand um, the, their perspectives and also the people who are using open dialogue. So uh, the person at the center of interest or the service user and, and their families and network members. So those are the bits of the trial that I'm working on with with Corin and others. So I'm going to share my um, PowerPoint presentation with you now. Um, I hope that you can see that. Um, so I'll be uh, doing an introduction on peer supported open dialogue in England and uh, in the Odessi trial, essentially, and looking at some of the opportunities and challenges that we found so far. So I might want to start off by saying that as part of the study, we have. Uh, um, embedded service user involvement. So we have a lived experience advisory panel, that's what we're calling it, and it's an expert resource for the research team to help steer the project. It's the main uh, steering panel for the project. Um, and it ensures that the project is practical, that it's ethical, and it's very re relevant for the people who might use open dialogue. So by lived experience, of course, we mean uh, those with experience of mental distress and service use or of experience of, of supporting a loved one. And by panel, we mean a group of people that meet to advise researchers and steer the research, obviously. So we've got a panel of 11 service users and family members from the site, and that meets three times a year, and that will be over the life of the study. And they provide ongoing feedback to improve the relevance, practicality and influence of the research. And really their main contributions are drawing on their own experience and their local knowledge um, of the sites uh, to advise and steer the researchers. They advise on and assist in, in recruitment and participation of people who use the local services or, or participate in the research. Um, and they make a contribution to any events at the study sites and uh, the LEAP, as we call it, is facilitated by, by Corinne and myself, and we're members of the project team. And as, we, as you know, we both have experience of mental distress and service use. Um, and the members agree how the LEAP will be represented at project team meetings and the ways in which they can best influence the research. So they have quite a lot of control over their involvement. So moving on um, to integrating peer support within uh, the Odessi Open Dialogue teams. So we have nine peer support workers recruited or already working within the services. Eight of those peer support workers are employed on permanent contracts 
one peer uh, is employed on an honorary contract and we have both peer and carer support workers. Now, I've started to use the term peer support worker, but that has changed uh, to peer practitioner. And we'll talk about that in, in a second. What we've been doing in the setup stage, we uh, established some peer practitioner action learning sets. So the aims of these action learning sets, as we call them, was to support the development of peer practitioner roles in the ADESI trial open dialogue teams, because it was, it was a new thing, it was a new environment for them, and we wanted to uh, support them and to uh, give them a space just to talk about how their role was developing and to identify challenges and develop solutions to some of the issues of difficulties encountered with the peer practitioner role in the ADESI trial open dialogue teams. They also provide reports to the central research team to feed into the program. Uh, initially, the bi-monthly at uh, study setup phase, but now the, the, the meetings are quarterly uh, with a peer practitioner meeting space so people can come together and, and discuss developments, discuss any issues and learn from each other and support each other. And now uh, the action learning sets incorporate peer practitioner focus groups to more formally gather data on their experiences. So um, we've already gathered um, some um, kind of themes from the study setup phase from the action learning set discussions that have gone on. Um, people have talked about their peer roles and, and the practice and about training on an equal basis to their professional colleagues. And one of the things, uh, the discussions that we had early on, and I've alluded to it a little bit earlier, is a preference for the name peer practitioner, which would uh, kind of suggest that they are equal to their clinically trained colleagues. Um, so getting a bit more of a, a feeling of power balance and, and equality even if it's 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 to do with your job title. Building blocks for good peer practice in open dialogue. Um, so related to the kind of equality uh, issues and 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 uh, changing the name to peer practitioner, we needed to create appropriate job descriptions and and pay scales for the peer practitioners. Because um, in the NHS, people who are in peer support roles generally uh, have very different job descriptions and they're on very different pay scales, depending on which trust they're in. So we felt the need to um, have some standardisation there, some parity and fairness. So we work quite hard on that. Um, the peer practitioners said that they felt they you know, they didn't need, they don't, didn't need to unlearn professional and clinical practices. And they wondered if, in fact, it was easier for them to grasp dialogic principles. The issue of supervision and intervision, we found that initially there was some inconsistent supervision practice across the sites and the peer practitioners felt that they needed better opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer supervision. Um, and the open dialogue team intervision inter could be more uh, dialogical there. Sorry, I'm having problems. That's it. Okay, it's gone to the next slide. So some more discussion themes. Um, one thing that's been a, a kind of consistent focus for discussion has been the issue of self-disclosure and the appropriate use of self-disclosure in, in network meetings and, and working with people. Um, and the issues come up about professionals' use of, of, of self-disclosure as well. How might that work um, in the network meetings? Kind of relating to self-disclosure uh, was um, the issue of emotional labour for uh, peer practitioners and the maintenance of their well-being. And one person described, one peer practitioner described the feeling that she had to perform wellness in her role. And people 
who are managing mental health problems while working um, in jobs that demands emotional labour. There are all sorts of things there that needed to be think needs to be thought about, need to be think thought about, and um, particularly around the maintenance of 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 well being. Working relationships with professional colleagues, so there was stuff coming about out about co-facilitation issues, um, negotiating power differentials, perhaps difficult dynamics and conversations, and distinctly the need for more than one peer practitioner in each team. So the peer practitioner was an isolated and they had another person from their background for some kind of mutual support. Our values and practice in open dialogue team working. So how do peer practitioners challenge some of the non dialogical practice in network meetings or the effects of medicalized cultures and treatment orientations? Is that something they can challenge? They're in a position to challenge or change as needed. So those were some of the themes that came up from the discussions in the action learning sets. And we thought it might be useful um, to look at the uh, general research from, from England about integrating peer support within the NHS. What does the re existing research evidence on the challenges say? And you can see from the challenges that I'm gonna go through and some of the solutions that there are echoes with people's, uh, the peer practitioners' experiences um, in the setup phase of the trial. So, some of the challenges from the existing evidence include um, working conditions and recognition. So, people in peer support roles in some of the research studies had no or low or unequal wages. So, they were being paid significantly less than their clinically trained colleagues in teams. And when we were looking um, at uh, pay and, and banding in the NHS for peer practitioners in open dialogue, um, as I say, it was pretty inconsistent across, across our, um, our team of peer practitioners. Um, we discovered that some people were on very low bands like um, healthcare assistant bands. So this is the this is the disparity across many trusts about about wages and remuneration. Related to this are limited um, opportunities for career progression. So if you're a peer support worker, where do you go? Do you go into a clinically trained position? What happens to you? So limited opportunities for career progression coming out in the research evidence a lack of role clarity, support and suitable supervision, which is of course what we found in the ALSs, the action learning sets, attitudes of, of team and colleagues, organisational difficulties in setting up the role, all those kind of practical things. When it comes to values and practice, um, at least in, in some of the research studies, peer support workers, um, they reported difficulties operating in non-recovery oriented cultures, so very medicalized cultures. And um, they felt that this they accumulated a personal cost in trying to operate in, in some of those environments. Again, the issue of the pressure to stay well, you have to stay well and to prove you're able for the job. Um, so that's that's the kind of performing and maintaining wellness in order to be a peer support worker while you are managing your own mental health. Struggles with identity construction and boundaries and use of self. So some of that would include self-disclosure there. And one study suggested that quality of life is correlated with support in the role, acceptance by your team, value for peer support and the considerations of, of personal costs of the work. So those are some of the challenges. What are some of the solutions that came out in the existing research evidence? And I've got a set of uh, direct quotes from the research here. So careful consideration of organisational issues when introducing peer worker roles, 
the distinctiveness and shared expectations of the role, strategic alignment, organisational support might maximise their impact. Um, and here's something that definitely has come up for us. Employment of more than one peer supporter and appropriate ongoing supervision arrangements delivered by senior peer supporters. And as an aside, when we were looking at the job descriptions uh, for uh, the peer practitioners in the teams, we came up with two job descriptions. One was um, the peer practitioner and one was a senior peer practitioner. So that's what we, we recommended to ensure that those supervision arrangements might be a possibility. Next, we've got attention should be paid to clarifying the remit and responsibilities of the role and preparing non-peer staff in advance. So preparing uh, co-workers from clinical backgrounds to work uh, with peer practitioners, with peer support workers. And I've put this in bold because this will lead on to the other slides around uh, some of the principles that Corinne in particular has been developing with peer practitioners. And this uh, quote directly from the research is that we need to pay attention to the values underpinning peer support. So this is a, a value based practice and we need to resist the replication of a paraclinical model of peer support. So. We developed or we are developing and particularly Corinne is, is leading on this with with the peer practitioners to create six guiding principles for open dialogue peer practitioners. So I'll go through these uh, with you. Um, I apologize because this is this is Corinne's specialist area, but I but I'll I'm I'm gonna try and fill in for her as best I can. Um, we have mutuality and connection. So this is the relationship offered by a peer practitioner it's a is a shared journey of discovery as a fellow traveling partner and the peer practitioner validates people's experience and reframes challenges as opportunities to try something different and the peer practitioner can connect with the person and the network in a unique way normalizing experiences and encouraging the voices of all participants in network meetings Next, we have attunement and sensitization. So through their personal lived experience, peer practitioners can have a deep awareness of themselves and attunement to the emotions of others in the room, as well as a developed sense of awareness and sensitivity to the implicit and explicit language that they may be using. So some of the unspoken stuff in the room as well. Dialogic practice and polyphony, drawing on their lived experience, peer practitioners can, where appropriate, share their own thoughts, images, feelings, resonance, including their own internal dialogue relating to their own life journey. And this can support conversations in which the uniqueness of people's personal experience and individual worldviews can be explored in order to kind of co-create new opportunities and solutions. And being with, being with that person, being with them, peer practitioners are able to develop relationships in which they are not afraid of intense emotions, where the focus is on connecting and being with someone in their experience. It's not about prematurely reaching for solutions, getting a quick fix, making somebody better, but it may involve exploring what a person has gained from their experiences and which aspects will help them in the next stage of their journey. And by explicitly and implicitly using their lived experience, peer practitioners can engender hope that change is possible, but we need to still bear in mind the idea of having to perform wellness there. Inclusivity and network perspectives. Being a peer practitioner involves exploring the meaning of mental health experiences within the context of the person's own worldview, their social network and their wider community. So drawing upon their personal experience, peer practitioners can often have a deep awareness 
of the importance of open and inclusive conversations and decision making and can help to draw out unheard voices in the room. And finally, self-disclosure. So the title of peer practitioner already constitutes a level of self-disclosure, indicating that someone has their own experience of mental health difficulties alongside their wider life experience. In network meetings, a peer practitioner uses self-disclosure only when she or he feels it's safe and helpful to do so. Peer practitioners may also promote cultural change within their organisation, encouraging self-disclosure among the wider team as appropriate, and recognising that many of those in other professional roles may also have some relevant experiences. So these are the six guiding principles for open dialogue peer practitioners that are currently being developed. So, as I say, there were, we are also um, including the peer practitioners as participants in the research. So they're being asked research questions like their experiences of open dialogue training, what their experiences of supervision are like, what, what are the roles of a peer practitioner, how do you see your role in the team and what impact do you think you have within uh, network teams and meetings and, uh, and the team culture. So I'm going to finish up by um, really directly quoting uh, some of the peer practitioners um, in giving them their own words, really, so that they're not my words, they're their words, which seems pretty appropriate. Um, Re-performing re can be destroying the self. As a peer practitioner, it's not that level of disclosure we're talking about. It's subtle, connecting, like, I don't know where you've been, but I've experienced something similar. When a peer practitioner shares their lived experience, it can get other people off the hook in the team from sharing their own lived experience. As a peer practitioner, you can feel that you need to survive on your own. Nurses team up with nurses, doctors support each other, and as a peer practitioner, it is difficult to find a role and relationships within the team, uh, particularly with a high turnover of staff. It has been pointed out that it's better to share lived experience as part of a reflection, yet feedback from family was that my disclosure was really helpful. The clinician open dialogue co-worker trying to address this was confused themselves, feeling responsible for fidelity. And finally, whilst as a team we may drop the use of labels, as a peer practitioner, it's being aware of the use of non-verbal communication to build connection and a sense of safety. A difference with being a peer practitioner is being comfortable with distress in the room and being willing and curious to tune into the main and fractured relationships within the room. So that's the end of, of our, uh, our presentation. Um, we hope that's been interesting for you. And again, uh, apologies and thoughts uh, with um, Corinne. Um, and I hope I've done her uh, some justice there. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And your, your your talk has generated a lot of thoughts and a lot of questions from from the attendees. So we've uh, got about 15 minutes at least. So um, keep the questions coming. Um, I think one of the uh, uh, initial questions was uh, uh, concerning pay, pay scales. Mm -hmm. uh, have there been successes so far? What what have you been able to do? Um, and what is what are your thoughts about that? Well, in, in terms of, of the uh, trial, we um, sent out what we constructed. So um, we had worked out using um, the NHS banding system, uh, sort of a clinical equivalents for peer practitioners. So we worked out the banding and the pay grade according to the NHS system. 
and then with our, our peer practitioners we uh, constructed um, job descriptions and skill sets to match those um, pay grades and those, those bandings. So um, we sent those out to the trial sites uh, with a recommendation that they use those um, with peer practitioners. But generally in, in, in the NHS, um, as I say, there's a really wide inconsistency between trusts and how people get recognised. Um, particularly uh, in concerning pay. I mean, some people, as I say, are paid as healthcare assistants, which is not commensurate with the role uh, that they pay. And one of the problems is that um, most of the uh, NHS pay scale and banding, uh, it is a prerequisite that you have formal clinical training or that you will enter into a management role. Uh, which links back to the kind of appropriateness of career progression, whether people want to go into a management role. And of course, there's all the stuff about clinical training. Some peer support workers feel that they need to go and train in therapeutic practice formally um, as well. So there are complications around working at least in, in, in the NHS context uh, with, with pay and, and career progression. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions related to that and potentially related to any reflections that uh, um, the peer practitioners have had about the training. The specific questions are, uh, are, are peer practitioners trained in open dialogue in the same way as other practitioners, network members are? Uh, and then again from, from Cindy, what peer developed and established training is included for pod teams regarding the inclusion and integration of the wisdom of lived experience? and peer practitioners in pod and bringing established models of peer support practices together with dialogic skills, parentheses, such as intentional peer support into the entire pod team skill development. Any now, this is that? one where, where I wish Corinne was here because she does so much of the training and she has real expertise in, in, in this. And I have to say, I, I'm, I'm not really in a position <laughs> to answer that question uh, about training so my, my apologies thank you i, I just uh, for our listeners i know that um both charmaine who's part of the pod training yes. here in london and martin who's part of the uh, pod training in the netherlands will be uh, participating in the workshop right after us and so maybe they would be able to to, to answer more of those questions directly yeah, I think Charmaine would be an excellent person to give her reflections on that. Uh, another question in regards to self-disclosure. Um, why is self-disclosure, why should it be uh, different for um, peer practitioners than various other roles in the team? I think it's just this idea of emotional labor and this performative yes. aspect that is that is always challenging. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think... Um, Emotional labour will, will be one thing. I suppose managing how much you disclose and what you disclose and when you disclose it and what's appropriate. And I think that might be related to being able to read a room um, and not and to resist or be aware that your self-disclosure does not override what the individual needs um, at the at the time. So it's self-disclosure in the context of giving somebody support. So as I mean, it's in one of the slides, it's, it's about it being helpful and appropriate, but also thinking about the cost of it to you as an in, individual um, as well. Again, Corinne could could talk about that because she's she's worked personally with with her own aspects of, of, of self disclosure. But that's what we 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 seem to know from the from the peer practitioners. Thank you, Sarah. This was uh, similar to a question I had about the professionalization of of the peer role. But Anna Maria Corridor asks, could you say more about the trap of becoming a para clinical practitioner? Yeah, I think. Um, from what I've picked up, it, it does relate to how people um, are expected to perform in a clinical environment, what's essentially a clinical environment, to which extent do they um, 
can they do that in it particularly where you know a lot of the focus might be on medication um this isn't i'm talking generally in 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 um say a treatment as usual um type environment um but yeah i the research shows that there is risk that that unless cultures change and approaches change in mental health teams um uh, and some of this relates to um preparing uh co-workers in those teams to understand what peer practitioners bring then there may be a pull to become what you know a para clinician and some of this does relate as i say to um career progression where does somebody go often people um do look to have clinical training um in order to to progress many many don't but that's an option um but yeah um you just lose a lot um and the and uniqueness and and almost the essence of what peer support practice is if 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 you become um a, a paraclinician so yeah it's it's part of the complexity of working uh, in a in a clinical environment where you might not kind of fit the the ethics and the values and some of the practices hmm. i'm not sure who said it first but they said often the training is is not so much teaching peers to be professionals as teaching professionals to be peers yes uh, yes yeah challenging um see martin thank you for all your uh, your comments uh, georgie you want to help me out um another question how do you keep the free space to develop your role and i guess that relates it's something that we've struggled from the very beginning is this work on job description should they be service navigators should they be community links should they be advocates we often use the metaphor of wearing two hats at the same time there's this um sense that peers are responsible for cultural change and for helping the professionals demedicalize their worldview uh, and, and, and implement a recovery attitude and that's a huge responsibility so what what, what do you see their roles within a, a a pod team and how how what's what are realistic expectations um, mm. well i think you know that it could be and people who, who, who are with you who have a, actual experience in, in, in uh, open dialogue teams can probably comment better than me, but it may be that uh, the practice is, is, is fluid. Um, so in response to, to, to what's needed by the individual in the situation and, and, and what's there in the network or, or, or not, um, there has been a, some emphasis on um, building networks and, and building community links, which may be appropriate or may not be appropriate. I mean, I've heard some, you know, comments that that's what a social worker might do or a different kind of peer support worker might do. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it go, you know, it, that, that demonstrates the, the many aspects that, that, that peer practitioners uh, of their work, but, um, there is, a yeah, I think there's a debate to be had about, um, what the, the people doing peer practitioners doing those different things, what they feel their role is. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. Georgie, would you like to share anything with us that you've picked up? No, so I can't see any more questions in the chat, but um, one thing that we were thinking about, Sarah, is if you could um, think of an ideal kind of dream situation, um, how would you see the peer role in open dialogue in the NHS going? Like, what would be the ideal role? How would it fit? Well, it would have... <laughs> <laughs> start start from the the bigger picture. I mean, th thinking um, that there would need to be some cultural change within NHS mental health services that um, enabled peer practitioners to work in in the way that they um, need to and choose to, um, and where they can use 
their expertise and their experience and it has the same value as that of, of, of clinicians and, and that means in in always I mean not just you know paying career progression but an equal value as, as a contributor to a team that um, is is focusing on somebody in in mental distress and also uh, as a sort of a group of, of practitioners working in NHS mental health services having a relationship with with their colleagues um, on a team level but more broadly to have to educate about what they bring and and, and their, their unique contribution um, the dream scenario would be um, equal contributors to mental health care and support uh, for people in, in, in distress and in, in crisis and having some leadership as well around determining what that care and support might look like. Mm. Well, I know we have a, one of our attendees, uh, uh, Cindy Peterson Dana, who's done wonderful work in the United States. And, and Cindy, I know you're listening, so you may want to respond on, on chat. But I think um, you're recruiting at least 50% of, of the trainees as, as peers in your teams um are at least 50 percent composed of peer practitioners and i'm thinking uh, i think you mentioned uh, sarah that there's we we have eight um peers on the ground just as just as a, a means of of of, of to, to bring it beyond tokenism of, of 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 them not sitting there alone um isolated what kind of can you see something where where pod teams are are composed of 50% uh, peer practitioners is that is that realistic that would be a, a, an ideal scenario but in in the context of of the trial and in 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 the NHS as it is at the moment um recruitment would be one issue um again the idea of 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 peer practitioners needing to come into the service um, rather than the, the services reaching out to peer practitioners, peer support workers who might be working independently of, of the NHS and mainstream mental health services. So people who are working in grassroots organisations, in user-led organisations. Can we change that relationship between who's coming to who and how those relationships work? Is it the case that we should get a bunch of people into a team or can we work more broadly than organisationally with as I say peer practitioners who are working outside the mainstream system can those relationships work in that context I'm just curious there's a there's a a, a global movement I know it's it, it's uh, I've got a lot of colleagues in in Norway who are working to to professionalize um Peer practitioners as as the only way to actually accumulate the, the power and the and the influence mm -hmm. and so um, pod teams ex exist within different national contexts. Do you do you see? Uh, uh, are you can you reflect a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of establishing something like a peer practitioners uh, workers union that they organize themselves and they fight for for their rights as a as as a unique profession. Yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly um, some people who are working as, as what they call lived experience practitioners in, in uh, England at the moment who have been discussing for quite a while about having some kind of union, some kind of collective to do uh, just that, what you were saying, you know, uh, for support development and and uh, to influence and to be almost like a pressure group. So those conversations are going on between li lived experience practitioners, peer support workers um, who are working in the NHS and outside the NHS as well. So there is some groundswell in Britain, at least, that, you know, there's a recognition that that people need some kind of collective um, maybe but whether or not it's formed uh, something formally as a union but definitely a, a broader national collective of people who are working in peer support roles thank you so much sir we, we need to end soon and martin thank you for your comments but i know you're part of the workshop afterwards so you will be able to answer your own questions there but we have one last question from jane macarthur 
who writes, what kind of opportunities do clinicians have to train to recognize the value that peer practitioners bring to the network? So not so much training peers as training professional practitioners about the value of peers. Would that be within open dialogue training or more broadly? <laughs> I guess you can choose to answer how you. Can I? Well, as I say, Corinne could could give you an, an excellent incisive answer on on open dialogue training. But one of the things that happens in 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 Britain, at least, or we, we, we're trying to make happen is in education, so in training for clinicians that um, we include uh, peer practitioners or people with lived experience of mental distress and service use in that training um, and in that education and, and training ongoing. It doesn't happen consistently, but where it where it does happen, it does seem to be quite effective. It, we do need more of it. But yes, flip, flipping it over and having uh, clinicians and, and professionals being educated and having discussions with peer practitioners where peer practitioners are in the position of educator or trainer um, would seem essential as well. And, and it's kind of happening in places, in, at least in Britain. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank, thank you for all the work you're doing as part of the Odessi trial. Um, thank you for, for making those changes out there. And, uh, an enlightening and inspiring talk. So, so good luck so and best wishes to Corinne as well. Yeah, I'll send her All right. your wishes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. We're going to end it there. Thank you for your questions and your comment comments. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Georgie.